Since there's been no, no sun around here. So how many people have been in the area for the last month? Great summer we've got going, huh? So, yeah. Woohoo, give it up for Seattle. All right, well, uh, thanks for all coming. I appreciate you guys. I'm not going to do stand up anymore, so I'm done with my routine now. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, also, I want to thank Brian, Katie, and a lot of those other people that have put on this event. So if you give them a round of applause right now. Thank you. Um, so raise your hand if you came in specifically to hear me speak. Came out from out of town. Anyone from out of town? Well, okay. I appreciate you guys making the trip. So I didn't want to bore you with any speeches. I was trying to think of what I want to say to you guys. And this happened a couple years ago. I was trying to figure out what am I going to talk about? Am I going to talk about, I give a math lecture? Probably don't want to hear any more math. Um, am I going to talk about philosophy, what I learned from Donkey Kong, I don't know. So what I want to do is kind of drive it from what you want to hear. So if you want to step up to the mic and ask questions, and I can tell stories, I have some stories to fill in too. So some of you might want to hear what happened after the King of Kong, I have a lot of stories that have happened since. There's a couple movies that I, or one movie I was in. So if you wanted to step up to the mic, they would like to have you just ask, ask questions from the mic. And if you run out of questions, I can start filling up with stories and we can have questions. Yes, question. Okay, what did you learn from Donkey Kong? That sounds interesting. All right, I learned a few things. Um, I learned that who you associate yourself with has a lot of um, influence of how you're gonna be perceived by the public and how that will determine your fate. So if you remember uh, Roy Schilt, Mr. Awesome? Yeah, so. You know, I, I still, I'm not in contact with Roy, I still, I don't know if I, you know, I like him, he's not a, a great friend, but you know, he's not an evil person, but you, you can see that when I got myself mixed up with Roy, and some of you might have had a similar experience, you, at work, maybe there's a person at work that people thought you were hanging around with too much, and there was a certain image that cast you in a certain light. So that's what happened with Roy, if you remember the movie, they thought, since Roy was, a devious person, I must also be a devious person. So that's one thing I learned about. Watch how he, who you associate yourself with. And then to be persistent about, you know, whatever you're doing, if you have a passion. So real quick poll here. How many of you have a job that you just love to go to? It's your passion, if you could do it. Anything else, you do your job. Oh, congrats to you guys. The rest of you, I think, if you're working towards that that dream job, keep driving for that, that goal because if you find that you're not passionate about something, you're not probably going to be driven to be better at that, whatever it is. So that's what I learned in Donkey Kong. If I wasn't passionate about Donkey Kong, I wouldn't have been persistent to continue that. And at Boeing, I got a mechanical engineering degree and I loved the schooling of engineering, but when I got to Boeing, no offense to Boeing, I found it was this paperwork, it wasn't a lot of actual engineering and problem solving. It was mostly dealing with the FAA. You know, whoever's with the FAA, don't, I'm not bashing you, so. Um, but this stuff, that wasn't really what I thought the job was gonna be, so. I, I, I learned that passion will breed persistence, so that will make you excel whatever you're trying to do, so. I didn't want to teach philosophy, so I'm sorry if I did that. Okay, any other questions? You can come to the mic. <coughs> So, thank you. Uh, the gentleman that got the Donkey Kong Jr. record, have you talked with him? I have, so uh, Hank Chen, have you heard of that name? So he's now the new Donkey Kong owner, so I applaud him and I called him from, I was watching my beloved Huskies in basketball against, I think it was Marquette, and um, I gave him a call from, I was, I was at Canyons in Redmond watching it so I gave him a call, I was with my friend, and he was at Richie, is it Knuckles, or Knuckles? There's a bar in Milwaukee, I think it is, or Milwaukee, thanks Gil. He's my fact checker, I'm just gonna look at him every time. Richie, <laughs> What's that? New Jersey? That's where Richie Knuckles is? Okay, so I gave him a call, and yeah, he was, he was playing for a game there, and he, um, he's a very good guy. I talked to him for a few minutes, and. The goal was to have all the Donkey Kong contenders 
there's a few of us that have been going for the record and some of, you, some of them that have seen the movie have started playing like Hank has only been playing for a few, year, few years. So Billy wanted a group of us to go for the record a while back to beat Billy's score, which was 1,050,100, right Gil, or something like that? 1.051. Okay. All right, so that's what the high score was. Billy didn't know that Hank was gonna beat his score. So once Hank broke the score, there was no, there, he was gonna offer a bounty for whoever could beat it, like a $10,000 bounty so of course now there's no event that's going to happen so Hank kind of again muddied the waters for Billy's plan but um, I don't want to bash Billy I don't have anything against Billy but I will bash Hank damn that guy you know I'm going to take him down <laughs> no I, I applaud Hank so he's a great gamer and I um, look forward to meeting him and playing him I haven't met him in person yet but I'm looking forward to that did I answer all that Donkey Kong Jr. is 1,250,000. I think I got 210,000. You did? <laughs> yeah, that, that one's on the radar. I, so I don't have any records right now, so if, I'm not a loser, guys. Yeah, so I'm not really a winner. <laughs> so I'm going <laughs> So I'm going to be, this summer is when I actually go for records as I'm a teacher. So once the school ends, I'm in my garage. I lock the garage door. No sunlight gets in. That's why I'm all pale. And... Um, that's where I'm going to not come out till I get a record. Okay, go ahead. I just uh, saw King of Kong recently. Why Donkey Kong? Why not uh, Asteroids or Good something? Good question, yeah. Um, so I was into Asteroids and Space Invaders when they were f first introduced. It was like, they went Pong, then I went to Asteroids and Space Invaders were around that same time. Then, then Pac-Man introduced a little more color. So we had Pac-Man. I liked Pac-Man a lot and I learned the patterns. I used to go into the bookstore and they'd always have these little little books that showed you the patterns. Anyone remember that? Yeah, little paperbacks. And I wouldn't buy them. I just, I sorry guys. I didn't. I, I should. I feel bad, but I didn't buy them. I'd look at the pattern and memorize it. And then I played played Pac-Man and got five hundred thousand, which I would always mess up the pattern. Sometime I was like maybe thirteen years old at that point. So, but once Donkey Kong came in, there was all this big buzz about Donkey Kong. You know. What was so cool about it? Well, there was four screens. Pac-Man had one where he just continued on the same maze. So that was kind of the bore, got boring, I guess, for the game developers. So they go, we gotta introduce a new facet to gaming. So the four screens was cool. The music was cool. I still like the music. I, I play it in my band and there, no. <laughs> but the music was cool. It had, um, the Mario character was very, for that time, it, the, the movement when it goes up the ladders, and it's very intricate, the, the, um, the graphics, I thought, versus Pac-Man was just this thing going. Um, and the, the concept of, you know, this character, Don Donkey Kong, has taken this mistress or damsel in distress at the top. He has a shirt on, so he could even be my model right now. So let me go through the pattern here. So you're down here. <laughs> <laughs> so Mario's trying to go up here, and, he, and she's saying help, and he jumps up and down once in a while, and, and then Mario's trying to get up to the top. Then she gets taken away again. Thanks, you. <laughs> so, give it up for, the, for my man there. So, and then it was just it challenging. Off the bat, it was one of those games that it took a few quarters, more than a few, to get past the first screen. Then you got past the first one. Can I get to this screen called the conveyor belt, or the... Pie Factory, you know, the Pie Factory. And then all of a sudden I heard this weird rumor about this Ferris wheel at the end of the game. Anyone hear something crazy about a board that no one heard is Ferris wheel, okay. But there is no Ferris wheel, the game just ends, as, I, as we found out, a few of us. Um, but all those things, and I just fell in love with the game. Once I found Don, uh, Donkey Kong was, basically Pac-Man was, was gone. There was one called Jungle Hunt that was similar you're this Tarzan character and you're, you're going underwater and avoiding boulders and things. So that was kind of a neat game. I like Galaga still. So, but never was into the fire um, ship, the spaceships. Too many buttons. Defender has too many buttons for me. So the simple jump button was good enough for me. Yeah. Um, actually, yeah, never played it. So I, maybe I should, Play that one. Popeye is another one that's on my list 
to get a record on, but I haven't had time. Because Donkey Kong has taken up. I haven't been able to get the Donkey Kong record back, so I need to get that one first. Well, what's the... Oh, really? So they didn't get sued for that? It wasn't an infringement on copyright? <laughs> Nintendo people, were you ready to sue those guys for that? Or was it a Nintendo game? Well, who made it? Uh, Tato or something, maybe? Yeah. Congo Bongo, okay. Question? Yeah, I watched the film and then naturally, you know, went online and got all the updates and went to Twin Galaxies and saw, saw a forum post about, like, here's all the many things that were misrepresented in the film and there are, like, yeah. several uh, record holders who weren't talked about at all, you know, between you and Billy. But, uh, so I was wondering what's on, on your list of things that were portrayed in the film or portrayed afterwards that sort of don't match reality, you know, and sort of yeah. what are the myths you like to debunk? There's, yeah, there's a whole page on Twin Galaxies. If you're ever on a rainy day, next rainy day tomorrow, you can go on with <laughs> Twin Galaxies and, and read up. There's a, yeah, the big Mythbusters page. Um, I don't, you know, there's some of those things are nitpicking and I'm not going to dive into those, but the main things that happen, if you've seen the film, are true. I went to the fun spot and that's what happened, whether it was intentional or not, that they showed the video of Billy's game and whatever the reasons are, there's, we could argue either way on those, what the intentions. And then I got my score was in doubt and then I went to this Guinness tournament in Florida. All those are factual. The things that, um, like there was one thing that Billy said he, at the Guinness tournament, if you remember the first time you see him appear and me in the same screen, he's coming into the door and I'm at the Donkey Kong. And they show him circle and he makes a comment and then he circles all the way around and exits. I mean, he did not talk to me. And he, he, there was something quoted that he said, hey, how are you doing? Are you, you know, it's not going so well, hang in there. And so that's not true. So there's two sides of that story, which I have to say the, 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 the movie is correct in that one. Um, other things, there's Tim Zerby, who um, there was a, uh, he broke the record in probably 90, what, anyone have a date there? Anyone on these facts, Gil, you know? <laughs> keep looking at Gil, like, keep him on your toes. And it was definitely during the process when you, was I was, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, there was a gamer, Tim Zerby, in New York that is a little upset that he wasn't in the film and um, so there, but actually the the way the record was broken is very complex there was a time I submitted a score that was 885,000 shortly after Tim and it got approved but there was no big hoopla about it I think Walter was going through some issues and there wasn't a big press release and then I got the 947 and then there was I, th I don't remember if that was the score that got blown to the media or if it was another one, but there was several scores that, you know, all the facts can't be laid out. It would confuse everybody exactly what was happening for the high score. So this, the movie just kind of streamlined it. But I, unfortunately, I feel bad for Tim that he got left out. Um, the movie makers said they contacted Twin Galaxies and couldn't get a verification of the score. And I don't know what to say to that. You have to talk to the movie people into Twin Galaxies. What about breaking into your garage? And oh, the breaking in, that's just a, the, the language, the breaking in was like a quotation. They didn't actually like take pry bars and rip open the garage door and come in in ninja suits and um, <laughs> so they were not with my permission. They had come when I was out doing some painting. I was painting summer, for my summer job, I was painting some houses. Not that you need to know that detail, but I came in to my garage and there's like the garage door is open and there's two people. Imagine if you had like your, if you collected a car, you had a Ferrari that never had been like Ferris Bueller's friend Cameron's dad. You know, they walk in and they're playing with this car and he's just like, what the heck's going on? So I had this reaction. I wasn't mad. I just couldn't figure out who these people were. And they introduced themselves quickly. Um, but I did not know they were coming over. But the way the story that I understand is, well, my wife, Nicole, just came in. Hello. <laughs> She's in about the middle room. Um, she told them to wait till I got home, and they were waiting outside my, my 
house, and my uh, mother-in-law, Nicole's mom, was there, um, and they came up one time, and she was like, no, you're, um, you're gonna have to wait, and then they sat in the car, and I was, it, I don't know how much time passed, maybe a half hour, who knows, but they got impatient, they come back, came back up, and eventually talked their way in, I don't know what was said exactly, came in, talked, talked to my mother-in-law, and she let him in, and she felt bad for them for being outside, waiting for so long, and then they asked for a quarter, so she gave them a quarter, because they didn't, my game was locked up, so they asked for a quarter, and they, and they played a game, and that when I, that's when I came home, they were playing a game, looking for in, imperfections or something wrong with the game, is what I'm understanding. Okay, the question is who validates these scores? Um, well, Twin Galaxies. So you would normally, we have to videotape your score, but when all the controversy started with Donkey Kong, they only allowed live scores. This was at the end of the movie. I, after I went to Guinness, I came home and I pre pretty much was in my garage for a month going for the score. Yeah. The question is, um, it, how long does it take for a, a high score? It's about two and a half hours if you're point pressing to get a high score. Point pressing, if you're not familiar with that term, it's, well, you can go through the screens really quick. I won't make you come up here again. Okay. <laughs> or you can wait around and try to make points, which, you know, there's a bonus on the, you have so much time to get through the screen, but you can milk it so much to get points that would be more than if you just cleared it really fast. So that's called. Can't you almost double the bonus if you're jumping Kong's leg up on the second? On the, there's one, the rivet screen you can jump. Yeah, there's Kong points, I don't know what you call them. But yeah, at the rivet, there's a blue, anyone have the rivet screen on their shirt? I don't see any. <laughs> so so I, I promise I wouldn't do any more stand-up, sorry. Um, so there's the, the screen at the, there, the rivet screen, Donkey Kong's at the top and you can, jump right by his feet and you have to press the lever. If you've tried it and weren't able to get 100 points, it's, you press the button in the middle of your jump, you have to angle the joystick right or left, and then you get 100. So next time you're at your Donkey Kong, try it, it works. So you do that and those point pressing techniques will get you, so it takes, makes the game take longer. Yeah. So let's, would you mind going to the mic? I'm kind of breaking the law here. Thanks. Do your kids play? Yeah, they Either console games or arcade. They games? were playing. My son was playing Donkey Kong for a, uh, maybe a few weeks after the the whole movie came out, and he got up. He was he was able to get past the third elevators actually. Was, so he has some of the gene. But there is, I guess Billy said it's in your gene, so he might have it. I don't know. But he's more into the uh, Super Mario Brothers games on the on the Wii, and he just found another. He bought a new Wii game and it had the old school Super Mario, so he's enjoying the old, old school Super Mario 3. So that's, I never really played that one, but he's not much of the regular Donkey Kong. He likes the newer games. Any other questions? I know there are some, so. So in the movie you played uh, the little tiny drum set. Did you get a larger drum set after the movie? Yes, I finally made my way up to the larger drum set, yeah. So yeah, the, the, that was the funny thing, that little, it's like driving, riding one of those little miniature bicycles, you know, it's kind of, looks funny. So <laughs> I either, if you thought it was a regular sized drum set and you thought I was a gigantic person, that would be kind of scary, but, so that's a small drum set and then I have a regular full size, but I can't keep it in my house, it's too, it would make too much noise, so it's in my, uh, father-in-law's attic, so I pull it out every once in a while. Good question. Do you think with dedication and practice you can raise your stampede score? I think so, yeah, the stampede score, it's, it's a funny thing how that came about. I was, um, if you look on the internet with Twin Galaxies, I'm 21st in stampede, it's a ridiculous score. At, um, <laughs> but there was this little contest that when I was down at um, Expo in San Jose, it was like, 2004, there was a side table and Brian King, who was working for Twin Galaxies at the time, was a referee. He's had this little contest um, for the, on an Atari console 2600 stampede game. If you know that game, there's you're trying to wrangle all these 
horses and whatever, you're this cowboy guy. So I lasted maybe like two minutes or three minutes and I got 21st, so it doesn't take much. So any of you can go out there and get on Twin Galaxies right now, play a stampede game, but I'm, I'll be working on that game too. <laughs> yes? How long have you uh, owned your own console, your whole Donkey Kong system, and uh, how much was it? Yeah, I bought my first one in college. I remember in, at the U University of Washington, I was visiting my fratern uh, friend's fraternity and I'd forgotten all about Donkey Kong. This was like in 89, maybe 88. And I remember walking in, his, his friends playing Donkey Kong. I couldn't believe it. I never thought of owning my own game. I was like, you can do this? <laughs> it's like, seems so out of touch with like actually buying your own machine. So once I found out where he got it, it was this place in Seattle um, on 4th Avenue. I think it's gone now. Like, Music Vend, yes, good call. I like a little quarter coming out of the logo somehow. Um, so I got one for like maybe three or four hundred dollars. I think I had some tax money returned from working for Mayflower Moving Company or somewhere. During the summer, I got some tax money. So my dad took me down there, and I, you know, he was a pretty good dad. You know, taking his son who's 20 years old or whatever, <laughs> buying him a video game. <laughs> you know, that sounds kind of immature, but he he went along with it, picked it up brought it to my fraternity, and I had about six people in there like every day <laughs> playing as like a band of us. And um, so I, I got pretty good. I was in the 300,000s to 400,000s in that time. Then I got up to 700,000. Pretty soon I, was, I took it home for the summer and I was up in the 800, 900s. And then I finally got to the screen, which is where you die, you can't get past it, it's called the kill screen. And I was like, what a rip off. You know, I was like, what happened? Is there an invisible barrel? You know, I thought it got to a level where you have to know where these invisible objects are. Jump! You know. but, so, so I got there again, and it was the same screen, same place. But I never put two and two together. I thought it was a bad, had a bad machine, like my, a bug in my own board. So I sold that machine. I, not that I was trying to sucker somebody off into a bad machine, but I needed money for an electronic drum set. I was trying to pursue a music career. So I bought these V drums. If you know what those are, there's virtual re by Remo. Um, and then I also had some Mark McGuire cards when they were worth something, his rookie card when he had a home run king, but now he's probably worth 10 cents. I don't know, probably not worth anything now. So. Uh, so I put that together, bought myself a drum set, and then I realized after I had, a few years had gone down, and then I found out when I was at work going through this layoff process, you know, what was the high score? I always wondered, you know, I was getting up in the 900,000s, this must be close to something. And then I looked and there was the Billy score. I didn't see Tim Zerby's score at, at first, and his was at 874,000. So I said, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and just buy another machine. So I went on eBay and it was about 300 is in Portland. I had it trucked up here. The shipping's what will get you. You know, it's like 300 for the game and 250 for shipping if you had it shipped from East Coast. So I had it driven up from Portland. It was like 150. So the whole package was like four, uh, 500,000. Then I fixed it up. So in, in a, what was the original question? How much was it cost for a game or how did I have my first game? That kind of gave you a little more information than you needed. But there you have it. Okay. How, how many games do you have? Do you have any more than that? I just have the one cabinet. I'm trying to get a bigger garage, right? <laughs> were, were you and serious about the Popeye, or are you thinking the about Popeye? Yeah, because it's a don uh, Nintendo game. The only thing you have to do is rotate the screen. It's it's vertical for your Donkey Kong and Junior. Now it's Popeye. They had to for some reason turn it to horizontal. Whatever reason. No, why, Gil? Why is that? I'm sorry. Why does Popeye have to be horizontal? Just because that's how they designed the game. Okay, the, I guess. They also, they also like, you have to do a little bit more than just rotate the you have to change out the power supply. There's some power supply issues? Yeah, so. Oh, okay. I might, so I might have to buy a new machine. But I can change Donkey Kong Jr. and regular Donkey Kong in the same cabinet. So I have actually two games to answer your question, but I have one cabinet, maybe two. All right, yeah. How did the uh, filmmakers come up with the idea for the movie? Were they gamers um, beforehand? Or? Yeah, they were um, actually my friend Mike Thompson, who's smoking the cigarette in one scene. He's like, 
I can't remember what he said. If you remember that scene, he's the guy smoking. He, uh, we've been friends since Little League. And in, in, in high school, I was the pitcher, he was the catcher. He was a singer in my high school band and into my college days, we had, had a um, band that circuited around the, the colleges, the fraternities. So we go back a ways and he knew, I would always tell him these stories about um, my Donkey Kong adventures. So I'd be telling him, hey, I got the record. And the next time he has a barbecue, I'll say, hey, these guys are in my house. And he's like, whoa, what's going on with this? And then I'll, you know, from there, he thought this was turning into something Hollywood-esque, if you will. Um, so he told his friend, I didn't know Ed Cunningham, the producer, I knew of him, he was the center for UW's 91 team that won the championship or <laughs> shared it. Um, so he told Ed, and then Ed met me at this, you know, one night in Seattle on a summer night, and we saw him in a bar, and he was like, hey, I envisioned you, you as a stoner going out to your garage, do you smoke pot and all that? I go, no. He's like, disappointed him. He had this idea like I'm like shaggy from Scooby-Doo just out there. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I might have deflated his idea for, a, for the documentary, but he said, why don't you write up the list of all the events that have happened? And they were finishing up this documentary called New York Doll, or is it Dolls? If anyone's seen that? Yes. So that's a good story, yeah. If there's Arthur Kane, it's that band of um, the whatever genre you call them. New York Dolls. New York Dolls, yeah. So it's a great documentary. Go around it if you haven't seen it. He was finishing up that, and then they were looking for new ideas. So he he looked at my whatever timeline I gave him, and they thought, well, this might be worth studying. And at first, he wasn't really going for my story alone. There was a lot of other little stories, like. Um, Doris Self was playing Qbert. They interviewed Fatality One. What's his game of fame? I can't remember it. Halo. Is it Halo or was it some other version? Okay. And then they also, there was um, Abner Ashman. I'm, I'm hoping I'm getting his name right. Was the Miss Pac-Man um, who was go, had the record. And they had a lot of similarities with his story in mind. They didn't trust his board. For some reason he was getting these at the end of the game in Miss Pac-Man, I'm not an expert with this, but you have these other boards that's like that come up after you've cl completed the last board and you get so many random number of boards at the end and then all of a sudden it will quit, but you don't know how many random boards you get. And then they thought Arth, um, Ashman was getting too many random boards because they thought it was some bug with him and he was cheating, so, but he actually went and succeeded at Guinness tournament. So I, don't, I think that's in the film. I can't remember if they showed him getting the record, but they didn't, I don't think. But he got his record there. So they were studying all these other stories, and it just turned out that the Donkey Kong story just had so many elements and twists and turns to it that they put, put together the movie at the end on the, the footage of, of my story. And I didn't even realize that until I got the copy, it was a, of January or sometime in the winter, and Ed, uh, Seth Gordon, who was the director, his dad drove all the way from Seattle in the ice and snow and delivered it to our doorstep. <laughs> and then we watched it that night and it was just amazing. I couldn't believe the story was focused on me, so I had no idea that was coming. Yeah, it was a pleasant surprise. <laughs> So you mentioned you're going to go back to your garage this summer and, and play the game. Uh, given that all the history and the fact that you kind of have a scarlet letter on you from, you know, as far as Twin Galaxies is concerned, like, are they going to accept a score from you in your garage? Are there special conditions or terms? Or does Walter have to be there with you the whole time? Or uh, no, Yeah, good question. Well, Donkey Kong is the, the game of the only one where you have to film before they allow videotapes now. And you have to film before your game, so you have to go inside your cabinet and film the board and all the chips and the control panel and all the circuitry, make sure there's no Roy Schiltz up in your attic with some hack board. <laughs> um, so I have to do that before, and then you have to do it after you play your record game, they have to do it again afterwards. So it's kind of tedious, but at least it gives you an, op an opportunity to videotape. Um, the do and that's the only one you have to do that on. All the other games, you would just have to videotape after the game. What about you? Like, are you Me? No, the, 
They would, they'll trust my scores now, yeah. I think. I haven't submitted the Donkey Kong one, but I had the Donkey Kong Jr. videotaped, and I got that back a couple times. Now I'm going against a guy named Mark Keel, a great gamer in Oklahoma. If you, hear, if you read about that, there's like the new Billy Mitchell. Man. But he, uh, he doesn't seem to be any evil to him. Not like I'm saying Billy's evil, but there's no, there's no hostility between him and I, at least I don't think. But so that Donkey Kong Jr. one, I, I've submitted tapes and they've, they've um, yeah, verified them. So I think they would verify Donkey Kong. Yeah. So, so you explained how you got into Donkey Kong. How did you get into Donkey Kong Jr.? Did one lead to the other? Or, and actually, yeah. which one do you prefer playing more? Um, I actually have fun playing Donkey Kong Jr. a little bit more. It's got this keyboard, not a piano keyboard, but the keys, where it's, it's kind of like, cool how these birds are flying and if you know the board and it's not it's one of the few boards on that game that there's no patterns the other there's two boards that the Mar mario's hideout is just a pattern and then the springboard is a pattern and the vines are pretty simple to do so that the keyboard is the only one that i really enjoy out of all the boards in the, all the games i think i love that one the best but overall i think if it wasn't for the keyboard in junior i would like donkey kong better just because there is more randomness in Donkey Kong. But it just led to jo Junior. I remember the summer of 82, there was talk of this Junior, Donkey Kong Junior game coming out. And I remember waiting for that to hit the, hit the market, and I, there was a place called DJ's in Factoria. Does anyone yeah. know where Fact Factoria? Yeah. Factoria rocks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so there's this little the music store called DJ's that had Pac-Man, and then they put this the Donkey Kong Jr. game and went in there. So well, just a natural transition. Same kind of playing style, jump button and a joystick. So it was, this lended itself naturally. Yeah, good. So, um, totally not fishing for any dirt or anything like that. Sure. But you mentioned that you don't have any beef with Billy and that he may or may not be evil. Yeah. Um, yeah he's not evil, I was in, just joking. In real life, is he as ridiculous as he seems in the movie, or is he a product of the editing room? Let me introduce someone. Have you met Billy? <laughs> no, he's, his friends and even Walter will come in here, I think. I've heard people at least say it on the internet. Everything's on the internet now. Uh, <laughs> that he's arrogant and it, this is kind of his the way he comes about you know but if you're a friend you, you might have a friend or two that if you were to put them out at a dinner party and you'd probably go well this guy's gonna make a fool out of himself because he's the way he acts if you don't know him very well you're gonna think he's arrogant and narciss you know narcissism and all that so i don't think he's tr truly evil but i think yeah, I don't think he's evil. Let me get that out of my head. I don't want any quotes on the internet saying that Levy said he's evil. But I, don't, I think the way he portrays himself can come across if you don't know who he is. And, and you can take things out of context and whatnot, but you know, he's trying to be funny. I think of it as tongue in cheek. You know, he reads the fortune cookie and you have a, what was the quote? Someone has to remember. Something about, Something about you, have for, you have a yearning for perfection and he smiles, you know. You know, he's just playing, a, playing it up for the camera, I think. That's just, you know, and you can either hate him for that or you can just laugh. I kind of just kind of laugh at it. I think he's funny. Just a little bit, you know. Uh, <laughs> so, I, and, I, you know, I, so that's the way I take it, you know. But some people will get emotional and think, you know, they're putting him out of, you know, taking things out of context. But I heard there's some other quotes in there they left out on, on intentionally because they didn't want to have people hate him more. <laughs> if you can, you know, I, I didn't see that footage, but I heard from the, later on that there were some. So, um, you know, I, I don't have any issues with Bill. I think he's just funny. Okay, you want to also before I go to my turn? Sorry. Um, in regards to Donkey Kong. Um, before you hit the kill screen, do you remember what elevator level you were on? Like how many elevators it took to get to that? Well, there's um, like 30 or 25. There's from level five to 20. How many is that mathematician? 25. Five to 20? Oh, five to 20, 15. 
and plus the fifth one, right? Okay, is that what you're saying? So six, yeah, so there's 16, I think there's maybe 18. Okay. So I think I haven't counted them up. There's the, yeah, from the fifth, ele the fourth elevator on it occurs on the fifth level, I believe, then there's 16 of the difficult ones, I, I know for sure. I'd have to count them up in my head. Yeah. The, uh, the guy who watched all the videos in the documentary, like, he's t talking about watching like a 24-hour Mappy performance or whatever. Um, he, he quit doing that after the video was up because of the way he was portrayed in the video, or what was the deal with that? Which, say, um, I can't remember, he was... He, oh, Merzak? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Why he quit Twin Galaxies? He did, right? Yeah. Yeah, why, why was I'm that? not sure exactly if I were to guess I would probably get in trouble somehow. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I think it had to do with just stuff that he didn't like inside Twin Galaxies, but I'm not sure exactly what. Uh, Walter's going to be here at 6, is it 6 o'clock? So if you stick around, Walter may know. He may let you, let you in on it, but he may just not say anything. I don't know. Are you uh, still friendly with Mr. Awesome, as you do when... <laughs> I, the last time I saw him, I'm trying to think if he was at this event once. Yeah, he was here. I feel so bad for him. He's got this walker and his, his knees are so arthritic. Um, so I, I feel sorry for, for Roy. But, I mean, he's always been, you know, he was just trying to help me, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, to get accomplished what I want to do, and I didn't realize until later that he was just trying to take down Billy more than he was trying to help me, you know? But, you know, he wasn't trying to really hurt anybody. I mean, it's a video game. Come on now, what, what are we talking about? Just a, <laughs> how much harm he get with a video game? So uh, I just, you know, I haven't talked to Roy. He used to call constantly, you know, like once every 10 minutes or something. <laughs> but he hasn't called for a while, so I'm, I'm hoping he's okay. Is anyone, is he calling anyone out there that I don't know? He talks to Bill a lot? Okay, he's moved on. I think he focuses on one person. <laughs> All right, yeah, question. Uh, occupationally, how did the uh, uh, After Effects in the movie go for you? I noticed that you have a lot of merchandising now for TV yeah. and whatnot. Is this like almost your full-time thing? Are you living off the residual? No, I, it's just a little. I, yeah, there's not much money in any of the merchandise, really. <laughs> So I put together a website. Has anyone been to that website? I don't know if anyone's found it. Maybe a few of you. All right. So that was just something I had a friend do. And, um, I have a CD I put together that's available. And it's, I have it out in the lobby, too. Rocks. It's like heavy metal, man. <laughs> no. no. Um, so it, and then the, the shirts were uh, a guy that I'd, who plays Galaga. He had the record on Galaga, Andrew Laidlaw has a graphics company, you might have met him at one point. So he put those together and, and he made them up to go down to like Santa Monica um, last year and it wasn't a, the right type of event and he has about three or four boxes that he had left over and I'm just kind of selling once, one every two months or something, whatever happened. <laughs> but yeah, there's not a lot of money, I'm still teaching. <laughs> Question. Thank you for being a teacher. Oh, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, do you think being from Redmond like affected your Nintendo love or whatever? The Nintendo love, yeah. The Northwest kind of thing? Yeah, I, don't, I kind of, it helps it at least. I don't know if it initially, I wasn't drawn to, to Nintendo because they were. You see like Evening Magazine and you're on. I'm what? You're on Evening Magazine. I'm oh. a guy from Redmond. Oh yeah. Playing a Redmond company game. Yeah. That, I didn't really make that connection until later, but um, yeah, so that, on Evening Magazine, the Redmond connection is definitely there. It wasn't something I thought about when I first fell in love with Donkey Kong. It just happened to be a coincidence. See, but, good question. Yeah. yeah. To answer your question, Nintendo really has not... Um, oh, are you talking? Nintendo really has not embraced this story or the, the movie, really. Even the, the producer director even met with them, and they're just not... Oh, well, I'm, I might have misinterpreted the question. Maybe it, did Nintendo come to me with any Nintendo really hasn't. Uh, yeah, you would think. Redmond Company, Redmond Man. But they really did not embrace the story. They didn't pick up on it. They didn't use it as part of any of their marketing. Um, the studio met with them, even mainly to make sure that um, 
they weren't using the name of the game in any way that would um, be negatively, um, you know, part of it. But um, no, they didn't seem to um, embrace it or want to jump on the bandwagon. Thank you. <laughs> Kudos. Thank you very much, guys. F town. <laughs> All right, question. Yeah, I'm a little bit confused. I thought you said earlier that, that you had to, to make records in Donkey Kong now in person, but, the, but yeah. just a few minutes ago you said you're going to record, you're going to do videotape recording, so is it? Yeah, so sorry, I'll video? clear that up, sorry. Um, well, after the movie, after I submitted the 1,006,000 that broke, that was at the very end of the movie that got the record, that's, they accepted the video. It took a few months even to get that one accepted. It was like another night. I thought another nightmare was going to happen. Um, like there was a, a Roy Schilt came out and made it. There was someone posing as Roy Schilt on some blog saying, "Yeah, I totally doctored up Weeby's board. Yeah, screw you, all you guys. I got you." And I was just devastated. And then it finally, everyone realized it was a hoax by somebody. So after that, then there was Billy came back, and I was at Comic Con. And I just landed in San Diego, and then Ed and Seth, the director and producer of King of Kong, said, hey, we got news for you, and then Billy just broke this record at a mortgage bro broker's convention. And I was like, dang. <laughs> so I was like, where's a Donkey Kong? I need to start practicing again. So at that point, Billy went through all these, this laundry list of, you know, I had this security guard, he guard the machine, he took a lie detector test afterwards to say that no one tampered with it. It was all a ridiculous list, but then they said, well, okay, for now on, we're gonna have only live scores. And that was up till maybe uh, six or seven, a few months ago. They've now changed it so you, ha you can, there's so many competitors out there, not everyone can fly to wherever to compete. So they now open it so you can op uh, record videotapes, but you have to submit a pre, game where you go through all that list of checking the board and all that player game and afterwards you have to now do another the check again so they do allow it again they just changed it recently hope that clears it up and, and, and then I'm not, I, when I don't doctor video games or know anything about sure. it is that do people actually the wire in chips or is that what they're looking for when they they're, when they videotape yeah they're trying I don't know how you can actually this puzzled me from the get-go how can you look at a chip and know that it's doctored. Is there any way to look at this? Magic. Yeah, it's like, yes. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> so it always confused me why videotaping a board would, but they can tell if it's definitely a hacked version, if you got some, Gil might be able to answer more to this, but you know, the double Donkey Kong, I keep on putting, sorry Gil. The double Donkey Kong board is what I got in trouble with to begin with. That's why they all hated me, because I got this, this game by uh, Robert Merzak verified a double Donkey Kong game. And then someone caught it later. And then they kind of all said, well, what are you doing? Turning in this, you know, this game, it's not a real game. So that's why they all kind of turned against me and they never trust me again. But so the afterwards, they're just trying to see if, yeah, is there a chip that looks funny? Is there a gummy substance on the board? <laughs> <laughs> Some of you laughed, remembered that. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Steve, uh, maybe you want to talk about um, maybe if you have any stories of the of the success since the documentary, and in particular the internet media sensation of what you became, uh, particularly basically a classic gaming hero that was, you know, just as a competitor you were you were you were really modest and, and again you know Billy be, you know being you know coined on the other side, uh, how has that changed? How busy you know do you keep and do you got any great stories from that? Yeah, I have a few stories. There's, um, well, a couple of things that have happened have been kind of weird. Um, like a movie called Four Christmases. If anyone's, <laughs> if anyone's seen that? Mistletoe. Mistletoe, yeah, exactly. So there's this Vince Vaughn movie that Vince loved King of Kong. And so that's how I got into it. I didn't audition and wow them with my acting skills. I didn't, I don't even talk in the movie. I sleep in one scene. <laughs> and uh, I'm playing a wee version of Donkey Kong in another scene, and Kristen Shenwith's my wife. Pretty good, I guess. And then she hands me a baby, and I'm playing in the scene. So it was weird, surreal, some of these things. I'm in this scene with John Voight, and in between takes, I'm asking him, do you have any children? <laughs> he, he didn't hear me. 
or he chose not to answer for whatever. I was right from here to there. He was holding the three-year-old, whatever the age the baby was. So then I later called my wife and said, yeah, does, I asked John if he had any children and he didn't even answer. He's like, what are you talking, what do you mean you asked him Chile? Do you know who Angeli Jolie is? I go, yeah, well, they haven't talked for, that's his daughter, they haven't talked for like years. So, <laughs> so that was an oops, yeah. So I got to, but he's a great guy. We talked at lunch, so I knew he wasn't trying to be standoffish when he didn't answer, so I, but I didn't ask. I was thinking, do I say it louder? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I just left it alone. I don't, I don't know. Something inner, inside me said, hey, just leave it. Um, so there was a couple bands that came through. Rascal Flats. Um, got to meet them. And Taylor Swift was that opening for them. Now I think it might be the other way around where they would open for her. I don't know. <laughs> um, but so then my, my Chemical Romance, which I didn't never even heard of the band. I had to tell my students in seventh grade, yeah, this band called my MCR, you ever heard of these? What? <laughs> well, they want me to come down and do a, play a song with them called Teenagers. And then I, so I went down with my buddy and we tried to get into the booth and the guy's looking at us like, we, uh, we don't know what you're talking about. There's passes for you, yeah. And they go, oh, here's an envelope. And they had some passes. And then we got into the building. This was down in Portland. The ball, crystal ballroom, anyone been there? Yes. I mean, the floor is like a trampoline if you ever bounced on that thing. It's yeah. like boom. So these 3,000 fans, I've never seen such maniac fans before. I'm used to a Rush concert where you have a bunch of nerds. I'm a nerd, I'm a Rush fan. But um, they're, all they're doing is air drumming, right? They're not jumping up and down. So, but these guys are just making the floor. I thought we were all gonna fall through it at one point. But I, I was trying to get back to the band and this bouncer guy was looking at me like, I don't know what you're talking about. Then finally I got back there and Mikey Way, the bass player and the rest of the band, they're all wearing these Mil Billy Mitchell shirts that said F, fill in the blanks, <laughs> Billy Mitchell. <laughs> and I, I, it was, I, couldn't, I, mean, I, was, I can't endorse that guys. <laughs> so I, I, mean, I said, well, you can think what you want, I'm not gonna. <laughs> But they were great, and then I, I, they said, well, we don't have, we can't have you do the drums with, for us, but we're gonna have you actually do a drum solo if you want, I go. So I hadn't practiced for a while. Um, so I was thinking, do I wanna go out there and, and just fall flat? So I turned to my buddy, Mike Thompson, who drove down there, and he said, well, these guys want you to do this. So I go, I thought about it, yeah, that's why they, you know, they're fans of the movie, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and return the favor. So I went out there, and I wish I had a good videotape of it. My friend just had an iPhone from like this, you know, 100 feet away and it's uh, dark and it's blurry. You can't even see who's playing drums. But I mean, the whole, I was in playing the drums, the whole fans were just going nuts. They didn't know, I mean, a few of them knew, even knew who I was. I think they go, yeah, give it up for Steve Weeby. And there was, didn't matter who they said. They were just like, yeah. And I, probably only a few knew who I was, but. And then it was just incredible, and was, that was just one of the other awesome nights. And my friend wrote this little paragraph the next day that, and sent out to all of our friends about how magical that moment was. So, we got some prizes. Oh, we got some prizes. So, I don't know. Can you come up with some trivia questions? I'll s just see if I can come up with some trivia. Okay. Um, I don't want to be the one to select. Would you select the people to answer? Or? Because I don't want to get people mad at me. You can be, get mad at him. Okay. Do you want to try a question on this guy? Okay. Ask him a question? Yeah. Okay, who was um, the gamer that kept relaying phone messages to Billy at Fun Spot? What's his name? Oh, I can't remember. You know he's the lawyer guy. Oh. Okay, it's a guy out there with some cards or something. Get up a shirt? Steve? Yeah. Steve Sanders, right? Not quite, no. Sorry. No, 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 sorry. Husky fan or which one? Oh. Brian. Brian Koo, yes. Your winner. Okay. All right. Okay, what? Let's see. What state 
is the gaming venue fun spot located? What state? New Hampshire, yes. Live free or die, I think that's their motto. Here it is, the soundtrack, congratulations. One more? Okay, let's see. Um, what's the name of the song from the Karate Kid that's in the scene fun spot when they're doing this big pan around this, all the video games and they're playing this song? You're the best around, yes. <laughs> Has anyone seen the new Karate Kid yet? No. Is it been out? Is it worthy? Sorry, I'm Good? Okay. All right. I know my son's been watching one, two, three. They're on, on demand. He's been watching those repeat. They're, he hasn't left the, the TV. So he's ready to see the new one. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask you to give it up for Steve Wavy, please? Thank you very much. I appreciate listening to me talk. No one fell asleep, so that's good. And I have some stuff to give away too, um, out here. Like I'll be over here. I'll get some posts. I mean, these photos I can sign for you. I have shirts you can choose to buy if you want. So I'll be back in a minute. Thanks, Steve. Okay.